Good afternoon. It is Tuesday, the 7th of September. It's about 4.45 in the afternoon. Uh, this video is a little bit late because of the Labor Day holiday. And speaking of Labor Day holiday, I hope you had fun and I hope you did something exciting on your Labor Day. Um, if you want an extra credit opportunity, just send me an email and tell me what the most interesting thing was that you did this three-day weekend. Always nice to get to know a little bit about you since I don't get to see you in class. So once again, for five points on your quiz for this week, just send me an email and tell me what the most exciting thing was that you did for your Labor Day weekend. All right, now going on to the notes, this is going to be a fairly short PowerPoint, but there's a lot of stuff that I'm going to talk about. So just make sure that you listen to this and maybe uh, watch this video two or three times just to get it all. But we're going to talk about what happens when colonialism comes to the Americas. How, how does it affect people? And I want to start with the conquest of Mexico. Uh, Mexico is going to be conquered by Hernan Cortes in the year 1518. And he's only going to bring with him about 500 men. He's going to defeat an Aztec force at the city of Tabasco because of the advantages of his steel weapons and his armor. He also, by the way, went against the governor of Cuba by doing this attack. He was not given permission to do it and was actually being looked for by troops of the Cuban governor. Now, after he conquers the Aztecs and he beats them at the city of Tabasco. He's given a woman who's named Melinza as a prisoner after his victory. She's going to become a teacher to Cortez and she teaches him about Aztec culture and she's going to become his personal translator. Cortez is going to befriend one of the many, many, many enemies of the Aztecs, uh, the Tlaxcans, and he's going to march with his 500 men and the army of the Tlaxcans on the capital city of the Aztecs, Tenochtitlan. When he gets to Tenochtitlan, he meets with Emperor Montezuma II, and this meeting happens on November 2nd of 1519. Montezuma and Cortes, they declare each other friends. Uh, of course, the Aztecs, they think that Cortes is a god. About a week later, Cortes is going to take Montezuma prisoner and he's gonna leave the city and while he's gone, the remaining Spaniards who stay in the city are going to massacre hundreds of Aztec nobles. Cortes returns to Tenochtitlan several months later with about 2,000 more soldiers. And between the 2,000 soldiers and the Aztec numbers being weakened by smallpox, he's going to able, or he's able to completely conquer the Aztecs by 1521. The final Aztec emperor is seized and executed by 1525, and there is no more Aztec uh, government or empire at all. So it goes very quick, this conquest of Mexico. You got the conquest of Peru. This is going to be Francisco Pizarro a couple of years later. Uh, Pizarro is going to lead an expedition to Peru in late 1530. He's going to bring with him 200 Spaniards. And he finds that the Inca Empire is in the middle of a civil war. A smallpox has just killed the emperor, and his two heirs, uh, are, his two, two brothers are going to be fighting over the throne. One brother is named Atahualpa, and the other is named Huscar. Uh, Pizarro meets with Atahualpa and captured him, which paralyzes the entire empire. Atahualpa attempts to bargain for his life and he gives Pizarro an entire room of gold and silver. Uh, even though Atahualpa gives Pizarro exactly what he wants and exactly what he's looking for, Pizarro still has Atahualpa executed on July 26th of 1533. After Pizarro has Atahualpa killed, he's going to invade and conquer the capital city of Cusco and he is going to take over the Inca Empire. Now, a lot of people ask, why was Pizarro so successful? The Inca were the most powerful of all the empires in the New World. 
And the reason he was successful is because of the way the Incan Empire was set up. All the power came from the top. The Sapa Inca, the emperor, was all powerful. So when you take out the top of the power pyramid, everybody else was paralyzed. Cortez with the Aztecs did the same thing. Montezuma was the top of the power pyramid. And once he was gone, power was frozen there as well. Both the Inca and the Aztec had outside enemies. And the Spanish made friends with those outside enemies and used those enemies against them. Then you have smallpox, disease. The disease, smallpox, weakened the enemies. And then last but not least, you have the superior weaponry of the Spanish. The steel weapons and the steel armor, that's something that the people of Peru and the people of Mexico just didn't have. So the conquest of Peru and the defeat of the Inca, the conquest of Mexico and the defeat of the Aztec is a relatively quick event. Once these two empires are done, uh, the Europeans are going to create local governments that in many cases resemble the governments that they just killed off. So there are governors in charge, the locals have some autonomy, uh, the traditional labor assignments positions are still kept. Most famous of is the Mita system where if you remember one of my earlier videos where I talked about the the people being able to work off their debts for the government while well, the government just changed hands. These governments are also going to be used to fundraise. Wars in Europe led to this need to raise money. Uh, and this money was raised by selling government positions to American-born Spaniards known as Creoles. So Spanish people come to the new world, have kids, and those American-born Spanish descendants, they need a government position, so the government sells them a job, basically. Now, the problem with this is it leads to a decline in the quality of administrators because they're going to end up putting profits before abilities. So it's no longer who is going to be the best leader or the best government official. It's who can pay the top dollar. So even though there are going to be lots and lots of dollars raised in the new world, it doesn't mean that they're being governed well. For North America, if you've had U.S. history, you probably know some of this, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but settlement in North America really didn't begin until the 1600s. And you have to look at places like Jamestown, Quebec, Plymouth. Um, those are the first real permanent settlement, St. Augustine, Florida as well. And settlements in North America are driven both by the prophets, just like South America, but also religious freedom. And there's this love-hate relationship that develops with the indigenous people. Uh, Native Americans are initially helped by European settlers, but eventually it's going to turn into competition and then resistance. We really have to talk about this Colombian exchange as well. This is really important. Uh, the Colombian exchange is a term developed by this historian named Alfred Crosby, and it's come to represent the transfer both intentional and unintentional uh, biological materials between Europe and the Americas. And this transfer, it's devastating and it's beneficial all at the same time. Uh, perhaps the most important of the new world crossovers is food. There's some foods that you don't really think about where they came from, but they're really important now. Uh, for example, potatoes, sweet potatoes, corn, all of those are from the old world and or from the new world and get sent over to the old world. I mean, by the 19th century, corn is the most important crop in all of Europe. 
Uh, potatoes. Potatoes are grown in Ireland and England and Germany, which are places where not a lot of stuff would grow because it was so cold and it was so damp and it was so wet. There's fish from the Grand Banks off the coast of Newfoundland. The tomato comes from the New World and gets sent back to the Old World. Just imagine Italian food without tomato sauce. In fact, the Italian word for tomato is pomodoro or golden apple. Corn ends up being the primary food of Europe once it gets established there, just because it can feed so many people so efficiently. You have the sugar trade. Uh, sugar was especially prized for its high profits and the main center of production was Brazil. Although there was a lot of, of um, sugar being grown in both Cuba and Hispaniola. Hispaniola, by the way, is this island right here that today would make up Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Now the reason that sugar became so important is the traditional European sweetener, honey, uh, it the honeybees were starting to die basically and there just wasn't as much sh uh, sweetener ar around in Europe when sugar was discovered the European sweet tooth just really took off and they couldn't stop themselves sugar was actually so important that the Dutch give up New York City in exchange for sugar plantations in South America uh, there's new beverages from colonies in Asia, and there's new beverages from colonies in the New World, like coffee, chocolate, and tea. Uh, all of these drinks are high in caffeine, uh, so they have a drug-like effect on you. Chocolate, tea, and especially coffee become the approved drinks of the middle class in Protestant countries. And they want to distinguish themselves from the aristocracy, who they saw as being addicted to alcohol. Uh, the close association actually between coffee and the middle class merchants can be seen in some of the businesses that still exa uh, exist. For example, Lloyd's of London, it's still a major insurance company in Europe and it started as Lloyd's Coffee House. Uh, I mean, the middle class adopted and drank so much coffee that Germany had to remind its people, hey, our national drink is beer, not coffee. Um, now, not only did new foods and beverages come to the New World, but there's new cooking techniques as well. Uh, barbecue was adapted from a cooking technique of the natives in northern Hispaniola. Um, these carib, as they were called, the, they would... Uh, take smoked meat over a lattice work of green wood and then they would build a fire and they would smoke it and that becomes barbecue only they knew it as bocan in french it's buccaneer in english it's it's buccaneer and in spanish it's barbacoa and barbacoa is where we get our current word barbecue so yes if you ever want to know where the idea of barbecue came from it was from the Caribs of Hispaniola. You also have African slaves who are going to bring to the British islands in the Caribbean their way of cooking, uh, particularly and best seen in their unique use of spices and frying meats such as fried chicken. Uh, these new foods and ways to cook mean that fewer people in Europe die of starvation because all of these cooking techniques are brought back to Europe along with these new foods. The Colombian exchange, it's going to make it easier for later generations of Europeans to settle in the Americans. Uh, disease from the Europeans struck the native populations very hard. Native Americans have nearly zero immunity to the diseases of the old world. Uh, so things like measles, smallpox, mumps, pneumonia, even influenza, they were just nuisances to people of Europe. But when they came over to North and South America, they were downright deadly. There are some places in the New World where the native populations had a mortality or death rate higher than 90%. And researchers and most historians have kind of settled on the idea that the total population of the Americas was somewhere around 30 million before the Europeans arrived. And 
by 1650, the native population was less than 5 million. So it's a huge loss of population. You may also notice that I have people there. And there's two ways to look at that. There's the people coming from Europe, and then there's people coming from Africa. The sugar plantations and the coffee plantations and the tea plantations, they needed people to run them, and they needed people to work. So as these agricultural adventures, as I'll call them, grew in North and South America, the, the use of slave labor grew as well. And a full 35 to 40% of all slaves ended up in Brazil. And another 25 to 30% ended up in Spanish held territory as well. All right, as promised, it's a short PowerPoint but there's a lot of spoken material, so please make sure that you do listen to this and write some notes down. Also, another reminder, just send me a quick email. Let me know what you did over the Labor Day break that was interesting or exciting. And if I get an email from you, I'll give you five extra points on your quiz. I appreciate you watching. Thank you very much. And as always, any questions, comments, concerns, I look forward to hearing from you. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.